Greetings and welcome to St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Welcome to God's house, where it's good for us to be together in this way, to offer our gifts of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord. My name is Tom Warren, and I have the privilege of serving as the rector here at St. Mary's, and I welcome you this day. If you haven't already, I hope you'll take a moment to pull up the bulletin for this morning's worship service. There's a link to it in the description to this video. Uh, of course, this worship service, the bulletin, will guide you through what we are doing today as we hear God's word, as uh, we lift our voices in prayer, and as we engage in the sacramental life of the church through spiritual communion as we are able to in this form as we gather for worship now. Uh, there's also a number of announcements at the back of the bulletin uh, pertaining to life and ministry here at St. Mary's. Uh, of note, uh, uh, we'll uh, celebrate that uh, Luke Miles uh, will be baptized at the 930 service uh, that will be gathering in person uh, this Sunday. Uh, and that will be part of what we do together at the spiritual communion service and the online service as we renew our baptismal vows accordingly. Uh, also, uh, there's a note in there about how uh, those who will be gathering in person for our in-person services uh, beginning in Advent will be uh, making steps towards bringing back wine at communion. There's more information about that and a couple of events leading up to that, um, uh, to that season uh, that I hope that if you are able to, you'll consider joining and being a part of. Um, and also, uh, there's some words about the vestry election process for this year at St. Mary's. Um, so please take a look at those and, uh, and consider uh, your part in what they might be in the days and, and times to come. But friends, it's good for us to be together in this way. I welcome you. I'm so glad that we are together and our liturgy will begin in just a moment. Welcome. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that, having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Kings. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I might drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jar. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make me something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord of God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she was as so she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, nor did the jug of wine, the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading Psalm 146 as printed in your bulletin. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. A reading from the Epistle to the Hebrews. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have to have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in log robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation and thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. I wonder, do you have a special practice or a thing that you do when you're feeling down? A pastor whose ministry I really appreciate, Thomas McKenzie, once said that he likes to watch the movie Man on Wire in cases like that. I I have seen that movie and enjoyed it too, so I could relate to what he was getting at. Man on Wire, if you haven't seen or heard of it, won the Oscar for Best Documentary back in 2009. And it tells the incredible story of a man named Philippe Petit, who pulls off one of the most incredible and outrageous athletic feats imaginable. When he was 21 years old, back in 1974, he and some of his friends strung a wire from the top of one of the World Trade Center buildings all the way across to the top of the other one. And then he walked across it. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the story, you're probably shaking your head and you're wondering a lot of things about what I just said. So, for clarity, I'll say a bit more. First, this was definitely not something that was allowed, right? It was completely illegal. And so it required the planning and the execution of something on the order of a bank heist, which is certainly a reason why it made for such a good movie. And as they snuck in and installed something like two tons of equipment to make this thing possible, then Philippe stepped out onto the wire. And when he did so, he was stepping out about 1,340 feet above the sidewalk with no lifeline, no netting below to catch him. And he didn't only walk just from one side to the other, and that would have been plenty But he walked out, and then there was this moment where he just seemed completely at ease. And so he laid down, and he did a little dance up there, and he went back and forth over and over again. He stayed on that wire for about 45 minutes until finally he said, you know what, I've had enough fun. And he turned himself back around and turned himself literally into the police that were waiting for him, completely helpless themselves about what in the world to do with this spectacle. And of course, we asked the question, why? (laughs) Why in the world would anyone do this? Well, if you watch the movie, and you listen to the interviews that go on as they describe the process leading up to it and what happened in that moment, one thing becomes crystal clear. And a reason for why for Philip and for his friends was because it gave them joy. When you hear them describe it, even decades later, and when you see the pictures of it, there's an incredible sense of excitement and of energy and of joy that permeates the whole event for them. 
And not only that moment, but for Philippe, right, he is filled with joy by tightrope walking in general, right? Just about anywhere, this, this crazy, dangerous, yet powerful and beautiful act of crossing through space. For him, it's joyful, so much so that he's willing to risk his life for it. I hope you'll check out the movie sometimes. Maybe it will be something that can pick you up a bit if you're feeling down sometimes. But here's a question for us to consider. Why do people do things that are difficult, that are challenging and hard? Why do some people do things that are so hard that it's risking of their lives? Well, some people do this out of a sense of duty, right? It's their job. Last week, I, I shared a post on Facebook from a classmate of mine from the Coast Guard Academy who was a pilot up in Alaska. And, and his crew flew out to rescue some fishermen whose boat had run aground in some terrible uh, weather situations. They, they rescued them, thankfully. And then they went back out, this crew went back out to see if they could find a young dog that was still missing from the boat. And they ended up saving that pup's life too. It's an awesome story. So in cases like that, right, people are risking their lives, they're doing a difficult thing out of a sense of duty, right? Their vocation or their calling demands hard things of them. Some people do difficult things out of a sense of personal urgency, maybe fear, right? Like there's a sense of life and death for themselves or for a loved one that is on the line, and they'll respond in kind. Some people do difficult things in order to get attention, right, to get famous. There's lots and lots of reasons why people do things that are hard to do. And today, we get a glimpse of someone who does something that is very hard to do in our gospel lesson this morning. Here's what's going on that day. Jesus is at the temple in Jerusalem with his disciples, and it's Passover time, so it was very crowded. And there is a courtyard at the temple which is where the treasury is, where people make their donations, their financial contributions. And at the treasury, there are 13 pillars with, with boxes around them, right? They're, the boxes here, they have an opening, they're shaped kind of like a trumpet. It's, it's like a, a, a horn uh, with a fluted opening. And that's where the people would go to place their offerings. This is where Jesus and his disciples were on this particular day. They're watching as the people are bringing their money to give to the temple. And we can imagine there's a lot of different ways that this is happening, right? Some Bible translations say that the people aren't just putting their money there, but they're, they're throwing it in. I imagine some making a show of it, kind of like a, at a carnival game, right? I mean, you know, really exaggerating it, hamming it up, tossing in the money in full view so that others will be more likely to see what they're doing. It's not like today where financial contributions to the church might be made online or you, if you're in person, you might write a check in the plate where, you know, a check can be written for anything, right? A large amount, a small amount, it all looks the same. But in the temple that day, it would be much easier to make a show of larger contributions so that others would be able to see what you were doing if that's what you were after. And that is what some were after. When you think about it, about why people were giving their money to the temple then, of course many, hopefully most, were giving out of a sense of worship, right? a sense of sacrifice, a sense of offering. It was part of their own sacrifice of praise in addition to an act of devotion to God. And some were doing it to get some sort of attention too, no doubt, right? to get recognized by others in hopes of becoming more popular or maybe gaining power in the system of the day. But pretty much all of them, at some level, were giving out of a sense of obligation. A sense of obligation because the Jewish law required that most people give certain things at the temple at particular times. But then it happens. A woman, we are told she is not only a widow, but a poor widow, comes up and she puts in her offering. 
She has just two, what's called lepta, right? That's the smallest coins in the ancient world. It was like half of a penny, right? You couldn't buy anything with it alone. It was such a small amount. But that's what she put in because that's what she had, two little coins. And Jesus says, this woman has given more than anyone else because they gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. She gave everything that she had to live on. And here's the thing about what we can glean about this particular woman's gift. There was something more to her reason for giving than a sense of obligation. B because the poor were not obligated to give money. And she was poor. In fact, it was the temple who was obligated to give to and to care for the poor. The temple was the one obligated to care for her. And yet she was the one who was giving. So why? Why would this woman, who had so little, take that little amount and give it to the temple? This woman's act of giving was literally risking her life. I mean, think about it. If you take all of the money that you have to live on and you give it all away, you are risking your life, aren't you? Why would she do that? And I love the idea that Thomas Mackenzie suggested about this, that, that she would do this for the same reason that Philippe Petit would walk between the two towers of the World Trade Center, right? Both actions were risky. Both actions risked their very lives. And yet for both of them, perhaps the driving force was joy. For this woman, she was filled with joy, the joy of her salvation. It was joy that led her to give cheerfully for the work of God's temple. She gave not out of obligation, not out of a sense or desire to become famous, although here we are talking about her, not out of fear, but out of joy. You know, here at St. Mary's, we talk quite a bit about joy. Joy means so much to us that it's right there on the front cover of the bulletin that you are looking at. Right? The bulletin that we use every week. St. Mary's, serving with joy. And that's what is at the heart of that slogan, is what Jesus was highlighting from the actions that he noticed in the woman at the temple treasury that day. That the life of faith, and for us the Christian life of faith, involves the giving of self of our time, our talent, our treasure, of any element of ourselves that is outward-facing as a way of our worship of God. And the very act of giving cheerfully, not out of compulsion or obligation, brings about the fullness of life, the joy that God promises. The Apostle Paul writes along these lines when he says in 2 Corinthians that each person should give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And it is obvious that this is not only talking about money, right? But about every way that a person could possibly give. The Holy Spirit is alive in you. Right? Remember, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So in you, right now, the Holy Spirit is present in bidding you to give of your very being, to be a living sacrifice, to serve in ways that bring an awareness of God's love into the lives of the people around you. And that will always bear the fruit of joy. Friends, the world needs the joy of the Lord. For those of us who are joyful today, if you are filled with the joy of the Lord, please don't hold that in. Share that joy with others around you. Because the world, the people around you who know you, or the people who don't know you but might see you or witness you, absolutely need the joy that has been given to you. Don't hold it back or downplay it in some sense of modesty, right? It is a gift. And for those of us for whom joy has been something that has been harder to come by lately, may we turn our prayers and our actions in an intentional way.
towards naming whatever blessings that we can name in our lives. And then with a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving for those blessings, ask God to guide us in ways that our actions might become very real blessings in the lives of others. I am convinced that in seeking and serving Christ in others around us, joy will be added. That's what the baptismal covenant that the family and sponsors of young Luke Miles and all of us surrounding them in our life of faith of Jesus will hold out for us to affirm today, to celebrate today. And while this life of faith for him and for all of us will certainly involve many challenges, many hard and difficult things, there is always the possibility of joy when our lives are lived for God and for others. Jesus showed us that. May we come to know it fully in our lives today. I've said these things to you this day in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So dear friends, as you know, when we have a baptism at an in-person liturgy, those who are gathering at other liturgies, either the other service or uh, those who are gathering here online, we have an opportunity to connect and to share in that baptismal celebration by affirming our baptismal vows. If you have been baptized before, I invite you to remember and to celebrate those promises that you made and also the celebration of God's promises to you that are indissoluble through baptism. If you are not yet baptized, I invite you to listen closely to what is being said as it articulates not only the faith that we hold as baptized Christians, but also in the life that we seek to live where that faith is made real in the life around us, in the world around us as well. So let us reaffirm and renew our baptismal vows together. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil? and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ. I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will, with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. And may Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in an eternal life by his grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that, that we, we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That, that your name, name may be glorified by all people. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Rob, our diocesan bishop, Tom, our rector, 
Greg and John, our postulants for holy orders, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that, that they, they may be faithful, faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Joe, our president, Roy, our governor, Don, our mayor, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on all who are named on the St. Mary's prayer list, on all whose lives and livelihoods have been seriously impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, and on all those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they, they may be delivered from, from their distress. distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let but life perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we, we also come to share in your, your heavenly kingdom. kingdom. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for our sisters and brothers in Christ at our partner church of Divinia Grassa in Mozambique and all of the people of the Dominican Republic. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, and forgive us, that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Dear friends, at this time, I invite you now to join in an act of spiritual communion whereby we seek with heart and body to make our full communion with God, beginning with the words our Lord himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Please pray with me. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. 
And since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus. And let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. God of life, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son through the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Every breath is a gift, and we only have so many moments to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace, remembering your baptism to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.